uh, down in the fellowship room downstairs. Everyone here is welcome, of course. If you know people that you think could benefit from a free meal, please spread the word. The food is always good. The fellowship is even better. So uh, again, that's Mana Cafe this Saturday from 11 to 1230 here in the fellowship hall. Now, <laughs> Ginny is essentially my brain. <laughs> With that, I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship.
may be seated. I'll invite our compromands up forward to help with our gifts of the younger church this morning. I really am glad you're here because I am in a bit of a pickle. So this is the biggest bowl that I can find. But I have all this candy, and I don't really have a good place to keep it. <coughs> You know, my desk drawers are pretty full, and uh, I don't want to look too cluttered. I don't want to just want to have, like, plastic bags of candy on my desk, but see, you see my problem. I have all this candy, and not a lot of space, and I'm really trying to figure out a way that I can store my candy so that I can eat it all by myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you think I should get a bigger? Should I buy a bigger bowl? I could get another bowl. Um... You know, I think there's a very easy solution. You just pour the candy back to the bags and you put all three bags into the bowl. Oh! Hmm. No, I don't I don't think that would work because they're like they're well, yeah, wider than like, yeah, I don't yeah. <laughs> So you really think that's the best thing I could do with all this and you know, I mean in my well, heart I of hearts. <laughs> and Maggie for teaching me about sharing because I wasn't going to give anybody any candy this morning. So <laughs> this is all on them. <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy needs remedial kids' church lessons. <laughs> Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will 
will drink. And with the baptism, you will be baptized, which I am baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave to all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Word of God. Praise Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. God is with you. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I should preface this story by saying I'm not always the nicest person. And a lot of the time I'm nicer than I want to be, which really what more can anybody ask of me than that I'm nicer than my nature would incline me to be. Anyway, the year is 2012. The setting, Allegheny College Fall Semester Finals Week. There's only one day to go until everything's due, but I've gotten all my work done early, and I'm looking forward to spending a day around the town with my boyfriend before I go home for winter break. Speaking of my boyfriend, I go over to his dorm, I tell him all my finals are done and dusted, and I ask him how much more he's got to do. Yeah, so I have most of my stuff done, but there's this one final I'm having a hard time with. Oh, what class? It's my philosophy class. See, we had this packet of essays from different philosophers, and we're supposed to read it and form our own ideas and explain them. Oh, I mean, sounds pretty straightforward to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it is. The only thing is... Well, the packet's 200 pages long, and, and we've had it all semester, but, like, I haven't read any of it. By this point, I, I don't have smoke coming out of my ears yet, but I'm turning a little red. I'm clenching my jaw a little more tightly than I need to be. Well, that's pretty irresponsible of you, huh? So what are you going to do? Well, well, you see... You're so much better at this philosophy stuff than I am. I really don't understand a lot of this stuff. At this point, I wish I had said, how do you know you understand it or not? You didn't read it, but I don't say anything. I let him finish. So yeah, anyway, um, I was hoping you could do this paper for me. If I do it, I'm not gonna pass the class, and then I'll get way behind, and you don't, you don't want that, right? Some people, having nothing else, will still have the audacity. That's about when the smoke did start coming out of my ears, so I wasted another about 20 minutes of his time chewing him out, and then I left and I had a good time on the town with my friends. By some miracle, he did manage to pass the class with a C. And I know the question that's on all of your minds, did you break up with him? No, I didn't. I had low self-esteem, but I share this story to make it abundantly clear to you that whatever patience Jesus found in him to deal with these clowns, James and John, I don't possess it. <laughs> to really get how egregious the whole conversation, their whole request to Jesus is you have to understand the kind of week Jesus had been having up until that point. Jesus had been grilled by Pharisees who were just looking for an excuse to lock him up, waiting for him to slip up and say one bad word so they could have him put away for heresy or blasphemy or sedition or anything, anything to shut him up. 
He had to have a little talk with his disciples about how they need to stop treating children like feral cats and beating them away whenever they show up for healing. He had a rather disheartening conversation with a rich kid who unabashedly told Jesus to his face that he'd rather be rich than follow him. And all of this is underscored by the fact that Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem. They're on the road to Jerusalem where Jesus knows he's going to die. In fact, right before the passage that Ginny read for us today, Jesus tells his disciples, Jerusalem is the end of the line for me. And still, after dealing with all of that crap, after hearing that their beloved teacher is going to die soon, James and John still have the nerve. Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. <laughs> what? That's not how you talk to anyone, let alone God incarnate. Can, can you imagine, Arlene? <laughs> I'm going to start this by saying, I want you to do whatever I ask of you. That's insane. That's crazy. So if I were Jesus, already at this point, I would, be, I would be done. That would be the end of the conversation for me. Way back in sentence one, my answer would be no. Just on principle. I don't even need to hear what they want. I'm already not interested. But Jesus says, essentially, go on. I'm listening. He doesn't agree to giving them whatever they want, of course, but he doesn't completely shut them down either. Now, I like to think that he wants them to continue purely for his own amusement and entertainment. Like, oh, this is going to be good. What do these idiots want now? <laughs> we can't say for sure. It's not in there. That's my own commentary. So James and John go on. Okay, so my brother and I, we want to sit right next to you in heaven. One of us on your right, one of us on your left. We don't care which. You can decide who's on the right and left. That's up to you, which, very generous of them. And even if they were just being demanding about a seating arrangement at a party, this would still be pretty pushy. But there's a lot more to this request than just a couple of chairs. Anyone who's ever put together a seating chart for a wedding reception knows how tricky seat placement can be, even today. But back then, it was a much, much bigger deal. Where you sat was a direct statement about how important you were. It was a statement of your social status. The closer you got to sit to the king, the more power and influence you were assumed to have. And in a society where status is everything, how much power and influence you are assumed to have is how much power and influence you have. So James and John are asking, Jesus, can you make a very public declaration to all of creation that we are the most important people to have ever lived? That's all we're asking. Talk about arrogant. What's even worse is James and John are part of a group of 12 people. So not only are they saying that they as disciples should get pride of place in heaven, they are better and more important than those other 10 guys. Those ten guys, the twelve disciples that are supposed to live in an egalitarian community that are not supposed to be better or worse than anybody else. By the way, that's how this story goes in Mark. In Matthew, it's told a little bit differently. It isn't James and John that ask for those special seats. It's their mom that asks on their behalf. <laughs> and I really, I thought, I... I thought about this for a long time, and I can't, I can't decide which is more pathetic. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty sad that they would ask for themselves, but also the idea that two grown men would have their mother ask for something like that right in front of them, and they don't say or do anything to stop her, almost like maybe they put her up to it, or at least agree with her. That's tragically embarrassing. No matter who is asking, though, Jesus' response is the same. Guys, trust me, you don't want those seats. I promise you will not like what you have to do to get them. Somehow, despite everything Jesus has ever said or done, they still don't understand that his way of doing things is not the world's way of doing things. They're still operating on old value systems, systems that Jesus specifically came to do away with. They still think that worldly power and wealth and influence mean anything. 
They really think God's going to reward their efforts to make a better, different world with the very old world stuff they're fighting to get rid of. This question isn't only audacious and ridiculous, it shows that they haven't learned a thing. They think they're letting go of power right now to get it back with interest later. They haven't been in it for good, selfless reasons. It shows that everything they've done as disciples so far, they've done because they think they're going to get a reward for it later. And boy, is that a problem the church hasn't gotten rid of yet. I came across a quote once that said the best people on earth are the moral atheists because they do good without any expectation of a reward at all. We all know that we all know people that seem to need external motivation to do the right thing. We've probably all been that person at some point or other. But saying something like I don't know, I only help those lazy homeless people because it's the Christian thing to do is not the prime line item on your moral resume that you think it is. Jesus is trying to move us beyond acting because of what's in it for us. The goal for a Christian, the goal for anybody claiming to follow Jesus isn't to try to get the biggest crown in heaven. It's to become someone who doesn't even think about what's in it for them before doing the right thing who just does right because it's right. Jesus tells James and John, you want to know how I'm earning my spot? Crucifixion. You willing to go that far? And they say, yeah, of course. Of course we are. Meanwhile, they run away like scared little bunny rabbits when real trouble presents itself. Now, as far as I can tell from various historical records, and they aren't without their contradictions or gaps in knowledge, but the best guess anybody has as to what actually became of James and John is that James really was eventually executed as a martyr. He really did end up giving his life for the faith. John, however, died of old age. Natural causes as far as anybody knows. The other disciples get mad at James and John when they hear about their request, but the implication is they're mad not because they're disappointed at how little James and John seem to understand about the lifestyle they're leading. No, they're mad because they, want the, they all want the same spot for themselves. They're mad because James and John beat them to the question. Because they don't understand either. They don't understand that the only proper attitude for a Christian to take is to give up their spot in favor of the standing room only section in the back. To be looking out for the needs of others. That's not to say that there aren't times to stand up for yourself. Jesus isn't asking for us to be doormats or to devalue ourselves. There are moments when holding your ground and saying no to what's asked of you and demanding better treatment are exactly what the moment calls for. Think of Rosa Parks, for example. Sure, she claimed a better spot for herself, but it wasn't just for herself. It was for everybody else like her. She risked jail time, a beating, and worse for the dignity of her people. Anytime anybody gets out of an abusive situation or demands fairness and justice isn't selfish. It comes from knowing how much you're worth to God. So that's where spiritual discernment comes in, because there are no clear-cut rules about what to do in every single situation. We're not going to find a detailed guide on when exactly to sit and when to stand, when to sacrifice and when to say no more. The guiding principle for us as believers, though, is a thing God has been trying to teach us from the beginning of time. We are all worth a lot. All of us, all of humanity, every single person bears the image of God and deserves to be treated with the utmost respect and dignity and honor and love. And sometimes the way to honor the dignity of the image of God and someone else is to sacrifice for them. And sometimes the way to honor the dignity of the image of God in yourself is to draw a line in the sand. I don't have a simpler formula for you than that. It's one of those case by case, I need the help of the Holy Spirit to figure this thing out kind of things. What I do know is it's the heart that counts. We are never going to make the right call 100% of the time. 
but we can more and more become people who let our actions be guided by love of God and love of neighbor. I don't know where James and John are sitting right now. Hey, maybe they did wind up with the best seats in the house. Jesus never explicitly said they wouldn't, just that it wasn't for him to decide. Or maybe they're standing in the back somewhere. My hope, though, for them and for us is that we would every day become people less and less interested in what's in it for us and more and more interested in following Jesus. I invite you to join in singing our hymn of response. It's found on page 359 of your big red hymn.
with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of salvation, who sent your Son to seek out and save what is lost, hear our prayers on behalf of those who are lost in our own day. God, today we pray for Kay Belts, for Sherry Peterson, for Jenny Strickley's brother Larry and friend Barb, who have upcoming surgeries, and for Natalie and her husband Jeremy, who are battling COVID. We pray for the family of Diana Stanley, who lost her husband this week. We pray for all those who we name in our hearts but don't say out loud who are sick or suffering. May they all know you as the healer and the caregiver who is closer than their next breath. God, visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us, that we would hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. And now with the confidence and the boldness of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. At this time we'll be collecting our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
grateful for these, your gifts. May they be used to shine your light into every corner of this community and all of creation. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Does anyone have a blessing they would like to celebrate this morning? Cooler weather. Cooler. Ginny is blessed by the fall weather outside. Such Keith is like, but it's still a little warm. <laughs> Any other blessings to celebrate this morning? Yeah. Uh, we finally have enough members for the handbell choir, so that will be going forward, and we'll hopefully have a performance for you guys soon. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Handbell choir is finally a thing again. It's it's back. It's back. Thank you so much, Aaron and. Ginny and Cindy and lots of folks who have put time and energy into making that a reality again. Any other blessings to celebrate this morning? I, I have a couple. Yesterday was my dad's birthday and today is my parents' anniversary. So they did them so close so dad would never have an excuse to forget. <laughs> so um, I'm happy for them and because of those two events that directly leads to my existence. So that's personally a blessing for me. So. <laughs> and yes. us. And us. Oh, thank you, Jenny. I wasn't digging for a couple <laughs> any other Any other blessings this morning? All right. With that, I invite you to stand as you're comfortable and join in our closing hymn. It's found on page 362 of your big red hymn. 